Hey everybody, Graham here. I was uh, reminiscing a little bit yesterday and uh, thought that I would bring some some of that to you because I was thinking about the early, early days of the internet, the, the, the pre-web days. And that was an interesting and very different time in the history of the internet. I got on the internet somewhere around... I don't know, probably 1992 or 93, something like that. This was before the internet was known about to the general public. There were buzzwords flying around like information superhighway and, and things like that. But people didn't really have a concrete idea of what that meant. The internet as we know it today, well, the internet as we know it today didn't exist, but the internet itself was largely something that was really only known among academic, scientific, and military people. I happened to be working at a university at the time, and we had, for the for the work I was doing, we were using VT100 terminals, which, um, if you've never seen one, they, they look kind of, if you've never seen one, they, they look kind of, kind of like this here. It was a completely text-based interface. There were very simple graphics. You could create menus where you would have several choices and you could use the arrow keys to select them. But that was advanced stuff. Most everything was text, command line interface, and just very interesting. And basically what you had for functionality at that time on the internet was you had email, you had chat, there was IRC, which existed then, which, I, which still exists now, and I think some people still actually use it now. You had, there was a chat program called NTalk, which would connect you to one other person. There were remote login functions so that you could log into remote systems and do whatever was on those systems to do. And there was Usenet. And Usenet was the primary gathering place. The idea of social media didn't really exist back then. So we didn't call Usenet social media, but basically it was. Usenet was kind of like Reddit. You had a bunch of different news groups and they were organized by subject and you could post something in a news group and, you know, people could follow up and reply to you and things like that. And and the better newsreader clients had threading capabilities so you could follow a discussion. You didn't have to read all the posts in the order that they were posted. You could follow a thread. And there was a lot of discussion happening and a lot of it was, was really intense. It had the feel of a bit of a small town because there weren't, I mean, there were, there were thousands of users, but the people who were really active, there were probably only a few hundred. And so you, you would kind of tend to run into the, the same people in different news groups. You might run into somebody in a music group and then see them again on a, a TV group and then see them on a writing group and see them on a social group, you know, and you would just keep seeing this person again and again and again. And, you know, so, so eventually you'd get to know some of them. And um, I, I made some pretty good friends. Uh, I, I met my ex-wife on Usenet before there was such a thing as internet dating. So uh, the, the Usenet interface looked a little bit like this. That's probably off of a more advanced terminal than the one I was using. That's, you know, clearly not a monochromatic terminal. Well, mine was, or at least the ones I was using at the time. The really advanced terminals we had were uh, Sun X terminals, which had a very primitive windowing system, which was the ancestor of, of the windowing systems that are used on Linux now, which are actually very nice. Back then, it was totally crude, just black and white windows, and your windows were basically terminals. I mean, there were other programs that you could use that would pop up in Windows, but they weren't anything you haven't used a better version of at this point. So you, you had to know what you were doing to be on Usenet. You had to know a little bit of how to get around in Unix because most of the computers that were 
able to access Usenet were Unix computers. Macs weren't really a factor at that point. Apple was in its doldrum phase. You know, there really, really wasn't much going on with Apple. Microsoft, uh, Bill Gates was still actively running Microsoft. And when he found out about the internet, which I, was probably around the same time that I did, um, he decided that he wanted to own it, of course. And, and so he tried to do a lot of stuff with Windows that would lock internet functionality into Windows itself. But originally, before that happened, Windows was, was somewhere around Windows 3 at the time. And it had no internet functionality at all. So all the internet functionality, if you wanted to use Windows, you had to, ha you had to have a, a program that created the, the socket layer that, you know, the, the TCP IP layer. And then you had to have a program that controlled your modem. And then you had to have other software that would allow you to actually interact. So it was a giant pain in the ass to get on the internet from Windows. Whereas getting on from Unix was easy if you knew how. Knowing how was a little bit folklorish. I ended up learning, I learned the very basics of what I was doing by asking people at the computer center. And they got sick of me after a while, but you know, that's what they're there for. So I found out enough from them to be able to get on and do basic stuff. And then from there, I met some people on Usenet who really knew what they were doing. And I would ask them questions and I would figure out how to do stuff on Unix. And that's how I learned Unix. And that sort of learning curve acted as a little bit of a gatekeeper. You had to know a little bit about Unix to get on. So a lot of the, um, a lot of the humor that was on there was stuff that, that would be lingua franca among Unix enthusiasts and people who work with it. And that kept things kind of small and very social for a long time. What ultimately killed Usenet was spam. The great thing about Usenet was that you couldn't censor it. It was completely decentralized. Every site would run their own server and you could get news feeds from multiple servers and you could feed multiple servers. So if you were running a news site, if you were, you know, the, the news admin for an internet service provider, you could really pick and choose what you wanted to carry and you could forward that to other people. And so you had this sort of mesh of servers that had incoming news feeds and outgoing news feeds. And if any single server were taken out, it would be very easy for the information to root around the damage. Somebody said the internet interprets censorship as damage and roots around it. So the great thing about Usenet was that it was uncensorable. The terrible thing about Usenet was that it was uncensorable. And so because it was uncensorable, first of all, you had some very toxic people on there. Uh, there was one guy, I don't remember his name, but he would post long, long screeds about how all that stuff that happened in Germany in the 30s and 40s never really happened. And most of the people on, the, on Usenet really hated that guy. I, I, I think he did get kicked off eventually by his ISP, but he found other ways to get on and... Uh, there was a group of people that they, they called the cleanup crew who would go around behind him and, and follow up all his posts with evidence of his wrongness. Then there was an incident called the green card lottery incident. It, it was possible on Usenet to post the same message to more than one news group. Uh, it was called cross-posting, and the etiquette was you only cross-posted if the material that you were talking about was relevant to all of the groups in, that you were cross-posting to. That doesn't mean that you couldn't post irrelevant stuff to multiple groups, and some people did. Some people did it as a joke. Some people just did it to be annoying. But the Green Card Lottery did it as advertising, and they had an automated way of posting the same thing to every news group. And people got really pissed. I mean, really pissed. There was just 
discussion for days and there were talks about ways to prevent this and clean it up, but ultimately no one could because of the very nature of Usenet itself, that decentralized mesh thing. So once that happened and other less scrupulous types saw it, that was it. I mean, once once one person did it successfully, there was no stopping other people from doing it successfully as well. And, and, and that's what ended up killing Usenet is just it got overrun with spam and it, it became very difficult to use. You would, you would go into your news groups and most of what you were seeing would be spam messages and you would clear out the spam messages and there'd be two or three messages in there from actual people because no one else wanted to hack through all the, the advertising. And also about that same time, the web was becoming usable and Usenet's functionality was being replicated in things like web forums and stuff like that. The difference being that a web forum lives on one server and the person who owns that server can control the forum. Now, that's a double-edged sword in that they can not allow or kick out people who are causing trouble but it also means that they can censor that you know if they don't like your opinion they can shut you down and that's largely the situation we're in today like i said usenet was not unlike reddit you have subreddits that are broken down by subject area and and usenet was very similar to that obviously reddit has much more modern functionality uh, i'm not trying to say that reddit is usenet or is a new incarnation of Usenet. It's just, it's similar in the way that it's organized and, and works. But prior to Usenet becoming unusable, we did have a few people on there that I, I think today would be called lol cows. Uh, back then we just called them Usenet cranks. And there's, there's three in particular that I remember. I'm sure there were more than three, but I, I remember these three very well. Um, there was a guy who called himself Ludwig Plutonium, who believed that the entire universe was a plutonium atom. Um, he, he would sort of post around in the science groups trying to get support for this idea. When I first saw him, he, he wasn't using plutonium as his last name. He was using something else. But then he changed it to Ludwig Plutonium. Um, the guy was just obsessed with plutonium, and I, I don't know what the deal was there. I just thought it was funny. A guy I thought was less funny was a guy named Albert Silverman, who was the scourge of the rec.music.theory news group, the music theory group. He believed that all traditional music theory is wrong and that he had a much better system. And he was very belligerent about this. He would insult people. He, anytime somebody would post an analysis of a piece of music, he would come in and say this was all crap. And it was, you know, he, would, he called it ancient theory. He's like, this is all ancient theory and it's all wrong. And he had a newer, better, modern way of looking at music. And he brought it out and it turned out to be just a sort of reorientation of the standard way of looking at things. And it, it just kind of went nowhere. But he was he was sure that it was revolutionary and that if just people would stop being idiots and believing that ancient theory and pay attention to him, boy, oh boy, we would just revolutionize things. And finally, my favorite of the, the Usenet cranks was a woman called Doctress Newtopia. Doctress believed that at some point in the not-too-distant future, there would be an event called the Lovolution, which would turn us all into perfect little loving, I don't know, we would all be equal, we would all be loved, we would all be those sorts of things that people with an idealistic, communistic bent seem to think is possible, that, that we'll all be exactly the same, except that our differences will all be celebrated and, you know, I... I but she, her thing was that she thought we should all live in arcologies, which uh, if you remember the movie Logan's Run from the 70s, they had those domes, and then outside of the domes was the, was the wasted world. But she, she wanted these sort of domes, or I, I don't know if, she, if they were supposed to be dome-shaped or what, but they were structures that, that would provide us with living space and working space and recreational space, and then there would just be, you know, lots of farming going on. Uh, so in a way, it was sort of almost feudal in that you would have, 
you know, the building in the center and you would have sort of farmland all around it and, and this would be a little community. Now, this idea was not original with her. There actually is an existing arcology called Arco Sante in Arizona and Doctress now lives there which I, I think is great. That's good for her. It's the kind of place she wanted to live in, but I don't think it's everything she hoped it would be. Uh, I'm, I'm speculating. I, I don't know what she's doing now. I haven't looked in on her in a few years. Uh, but the last time I did look in on her, she was at Arcosanti and and still still cranking out her, her love illusion stuff, uh, even as she's probably pushing 70 now. She was a lol cow in the truest sense because you could interact with her and she would generally do something that would make you laugh. She was just so ridiculous about everything. She was, if you can imagine a caricature of a PC hippie who's just completely impervious to any kind of outside reasoning, that was her. So there it is. You have the prehistoric lol cows. You have the landscape of the internet before the web. And I hope you've enjoyed this because I, I've enjoyed reminiscing about it. It was a fun time. It was a time when the internet could have been anything and it wasn't being dominated by companies like Facebook and Google. The biggest concern we had was Microsoft. And the only reason anybody cared about Microsoft is that the new users coming on were more Windows users than, than Unix users. And we were worried that Microsoft would change the protocols enough that there would be certain things that you could only do on Windows that you couldn't do on the rest of the internet. It did not work out well for Microsoft in that way. And Apple wasn't really a factor because they were sort of in the doldrums at the time. But there it is, the land before time. Hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed telling you about it. 